Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another session of Zeiss Conversations. We have got a full and packed house for you today. Uh, guest with us is going to talk about how he creates stories for the photos that he's he's putting into the frame. And, of course, we've got Tracy and Kenneth with us, uh, as always. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet everybody. So I have put Ms. Professor Kenneth Hines into the center square this week. <sighs> Yay, Ken. So Ken is back from it. <laughs> Ken is joining us from uh, from a field trip uh, that he just took as uh, to shoot some some uh, photography in the woods. Um, so welcome to have you back here, Kenneth, with us. Tracy Page, as always, is our Zeiss ambassador and portrait photography uh, uh, aficionado. She'll be here <laughs> working with us and asking the questions. And then our uh, uh, special guest with us today is a professor, is a photographer, Kenneth Kevin Lyle. See. Kenneth, I put you in the in the center square. I'm so excited to have you there. I'm I'm now screwing up everything with our guest, Kevin. <laughs> it's great to have you here, uh, and welcome to everybody uh, for today's great event. Kevin, I wanted to give you some time to introduce yourself to to our audience and and tell us a little bit about um, how you became a photographer and and what drives your passion to shoot. Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me today. So excited to do this. Um, really looking forward to it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm an independent photographer here in Atlanta, um, total freelance. Um, I shoot uh, a lot of editorial work, a lot of sports work, some commercial work. Uh, you know, I got started, it was back in 2001, and I was telling you, Tracy, I, start, I used to live in South Georgia. Uh, I became a reporter, I got a job as a reporter at the Moultrie Observer, a really small town in South Georgia, and had never taken, I was 21, I'd never taken pictures uh, seriously in my life. And they handed me a Canon AE-1 with a 50 millimeter lens and, you know, it said, take pictures on your assignments. I got a couple tips from the staff photographer and, you know, started, started doing exactly that. And uh, that's when I fell in love with photography and decided, you know, over the course of, you know, a year or two, I decided that's what I wanted to do. And I worked at a few more newspapers uh, and I quit to go finish my degree um, and became a full-time assistant during this time uh, for Sports Illustrated. And worked there for four to five years as an assistant um, for Bob Rosado mainly. He he lives uh, near 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 Atlanta, so I started working with him, and then went full time freelance in 2012. And so here I am. I know that was kind of a really compressed edition of my history, but yeah, you know I'm team photographer team photographer for the Atlanta Braves uh, here in Atlanta. Started in midway through the season in 2018. Uh, then shot all of 2019 and, you know, we'll hopefully start on 2020 whenever, whenever it starts, ever how that starts. Right. Right. Uh, you know, work for a lot of editorial clients, especially lately, uh, you know, with all the news on coronavirus, been doing a lot of work for Washington post and New York times, uh, covering that here in Atlanta, you know, Georgia is one of the first states to start the reopening phases. So it's been a lot of stuff about that. Uh, so yeah, do some commercial work too. Um, but yeah, anyway, that, that's kind of a, uh, summed up. Uh, version of how I got to where I am. And you, congratulations too. I, I've seen you uh, with the above the fold image a couple of weeks ago in the Washington Post. Yes, I was. I was like, I know him. This is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you. I think you had two images the same day in the in the New York Times. So that was mm -hmm. was a really cool day for you. So um, I love that you're a photojournalist first, and then that's what you can bring to your work at the Braves. I think that's that's really cool. And I met Kevin just recently through Atlanta Photo Night. Um, I am, you know, with being staying at home like all of us, I'm trying to reach out and meet a larger community than I've ever had the opportunity to meet before. So I started attending, I saw on the uh, APA um, website, a notice about Atlanta Photo Night. So I went to one and really just think it's a, so for our professional photographers out there, you don't even have to be in Atlanta it's just a great group and now they're meeting virtually. So that means we can, we can bring people in from all over. And I think it's been a lot of fun. So kudos to you and Ray for doing that. How long have you been doing that? Thank you. Yeah. Ray and I started ATL photo night back in 2016 and really it was just a very simple concept. We said, Hey, you know, let's, when I would meet photographers, I would want to hear about their creative process, like what it is that drives them to take pictures particularly with portraits, I'm always fascinated in how people get, how photographers get subjects to relax, how they get them to do whatever it is they want to do. There's a, there's a psychology and some magic and science behind all that, that you can't learn in a book. Right. So I'm always fascinated with that, but just in general, we wanted to talk about the creative process. So 
we just decided, hey, well, let's just bring photographers in, have them show work and, and make it a moderated discussion to where we talk, you know, we talk about it with the artist to a group of people. And I mean, it just, we were blown away at how, how many people came out to these events. At one, we had like 150. Uh, there have been monthly events ever since 2016. And then since coronavirus, we've been doing Instagram live talks and we're, we're starting a podcast. So uh, yeah, it's been great. I mean, it, 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 there's, uh, it's just been a great support around it, you know, just mainly talking about creative process. It, with ATL Photo Night, we try to stay away from like gadget and gear talk. You know, we want to talk more about the process than, than the cameras and lenses and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun and, and really rewarding. Well, you're welcome to come hang out on me, hang out with me during my portrait process anytime. I would, I would right. welcome that. Um, but it is, it's a lot of psychology. You're right. And that's, I like that the conversation there is a little bit different than, than the gadget and gear. And I have heard um, one of my, uh, one of my best photography friends is Ellis Wiener and he is a gadget and gear guy, but he's told me about this and uh, Johnny Spring at PPR mm -hmm. has told me oh, yeah. about it and at Phil at KEH and, you know, so finally it was like, all right, I need to get involved. And <laughs> look, it's virtual. I live four hours out of Atlanta, so I can actually attend a virtual meeting. So this is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, great, great. I'm glad you can make it, yeah. Or make it to the virtual talks anyway, right? Yeah, now hopefully I'm going to try to, when you get back to the non-virtual stuff, I'm going to see if I can schedule my work around going. So uh, hopefully I can make it to some of those too and meet everybody in person. So I do think that it's really fascinating that you are a photojournalist first. So Tell us a little bit about how you take photojournalism into what you're doing with your sports photography. Sure. So, you know, I just look at everything I shoot as this may sound cliche. It's just telling a story. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm looking for moments. I'm looking for something that captures the essence of, you know, what, what it is that the sporting event is about. I mean, to me, uh, the action on the field is just one small percentage of what happens at a sporting event. You know, there's tens of thousands of fans in the, in the stands. I mean, not now, obviously, but up until coronavirus, you know, there's concession stands, there's people tailgating, there's like all sorts of just visually rich stories that, that can be told. And, uh, so these are the things that excite me about sporting events. I mean, obviously the game is amazing and I love, I love photographing action as well, but you know, I just try to tell, I just try to tell stories and look for stories within, within the sporting environment. Like I did an essay for the Braves. Um, I just focused on the grounds crew. Right. And that's kind of low hanging fruit that to me, that's easy. Like it's, Oh, these, this is grounds crew. Like they're, they're doing something. Let's, let's follow them. What are they doing? Anything that I just find myself curious about, like what, what do they do? Let's go find out. Let's take a camera. Let's go talk to them and take more pictures and hang out. And, and, and that's, that's really what drives me is just that curiosity about what's happening. You know, I get curious about, you know, how they make cotton candy or, you know, how do they put the thing together that sells the hot dogs or whatever. I mean, all that stuff to me is, is, is interesting. And I think that it can be stories that can be told visually. So from looking at like one of the shots that Tony has up here, where it's a little kid uh, <laughs> kind of shaking one of the, the player's hands, you know, being a photojournalist, um, how do you see that uh, affecting what you capture? Because it's, does, do you feel that's an advantage to you having that kind of knowledge and that kind of skill as far as when you take it to the sports in photographing a baseball game as far as what you're looking at, because you're now looking at beyond the actual gameplay. You're looking beyond, you know, yeah. what's happening on the field between the coaches, uh, between the umpires, things like that. You're actually looking in the stands. You're looking at what it actually takes behind the scenes to run a, a stadium up, to run a game. So how do you feel that approach comes with the type of images that you take and having that photojournalism uh, um, knowledge? No, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's something I can't turn off, right? I mean, it's something. It's just how I how I see it, and sometimes it's a detriment because I'm paying attention to other things besides the game, right? <laughs> Instead of like dialed into what's happening, you know. This is Freddie Freeman. Uh, that's his son um, touching his hand or shaking his fingers there, basically. Oh wow! And it's one of those events. Like I'm standing obviously behind the gate there, behind the netting, and Freddie's on deck, and you can just see this moment as it's about to unfold. You see Freddie walking up. He's turning around, and of course. I shoot, you know, 81 home games a year. So, 
you know, it's a lot of repetition. You know how these things happen. And on top of it, looking outside of the game keeps me sane because I mean, it can get very monotonous. It does get very monotonous, you know, 81 home games, you know, so sometimes these are 10 games in a row, 10 days in a row. So this moment here, you could just see it unfold as the, you know, Freddie's walking up, he's waving at, at his son. And, you know, it's just one of those moments where you just, just shoot, you know, if nothing happens, nothing happens, but if it does, then great. You know, I didn't expect it to happen like this. And I was really pleasantly surprised and, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, love it when stuff like this, when it all comes together, but it's really just paying attention and, and doing that. And you're right. It's, you know, having a photo journalism background and, and doing this for so long. And I still do a lot of photojournalism um, really just uh, keeps that alive and keeps that part of my brain active and telling stories because, you know, I, there's just so many, there's so many stories outside of the action, you know, I mean, how many, how many times have you seen a picture of a really tight shot of a guy carrying a football or the pitcher throwing, you know, like we've all seen that a million times and those pictures are important. You have to get those pictures. But to me, uh, the other stuff is just really exciting. You know, there's a picture in there we can talk about. Uh, it's a Falcons picture. It's a, it's a guy um, with a strobe and a tunnel highlighting a uh, player. I did, I shot an entire season. Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, I shot an entire season with the Falcons in 2015 and uh, that's all I shot was what I call the peripheral, right? Just around the game. I didn't shoot any action. Like I, I hung out on the sidelines. I hung out in the tunnels. I put that light in a tunnel so that I could photograph these players coming through and just make it extremely dramatic. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that I like to do, or the kinds of pictures I like to make at sporting events and not just, um, you know, action. Mm -hmm. There's a, the, a wedding photographer, Joe Busnick, who, who likes to say he's famous. He did like Kelly Pickler and he does mm -hmm. a lot of the big stars. And he always likes to say that he likes to be the second shooter, that he gives the shot list to the first shooter and he goes and does the second shooting. It sounds like with the Falcons, that's what you got to do, that you got to do the more creative and dramatic stuff and, and not have to focus on the necessary shot list. When you're yeah. working with the Braves now, Tell me, is there like a shot list of things that you have to get? What What is that? Yeah, there's always a shot list for stuff like that. Most of it is pregame. There's a lot of stuff that happens pregame, uh, you know, like the, the ceremonial first pitch. Um, you know, and I'll tell you that ceremonial first pitch happens very fast. Like there's not a whole lot of announcements about that. Like you've got to be ready because they walk out and just throw the ball, right? So the ceremonial first pitch, there's like the, um, um, oh gosh, the, the, the person that walks out with like a coach, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank right now. They, when the umpires go out, they walk out with the coaches, they present the, uh, you know, their rosters to the umpires and they turn around, I'll take a picture of those guys. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And there's, there'll be some in game stuff like signage and different, you know, um, sponsor needs that, that need to take place. And sure. Like, you know, you have to get those things and you just make sure that you do get them because those, those things are very important. Uh, but you know, I like that second shooter approach that Joe talks about. I mean, uh, because I I've joked about it. I would love, I, I would love to have a career being like just second shooter at weddings, right? Like, or second shooter at things because the pressure's off. You can be creative. And like with the Falcon stuff, I was, I was showing you there, like, or talking about, um, you're right. I mean, I didn't have any pressure on the action. I told him I, like, please, I don't want to shoot any action. Like if you need me to fine. if it's a big event, a big play about to happen, you know, whatever game winning touchdown. Sure. I'll come out there and shoot. I don't mind. I, I like doing that stuff too, but just, just focusing on the stuff around. I mean, I took a, an assistant with the light during this, this, one of these games and just photographed fans, you know, out, out tailgating and that you don't see a lot of that kind of stuff with professional team sports photography, right? It's mostly just like player oriented. And, you know, I got a picture of a guy with his bicep with this huge, falcons um i have a small bicep but he had a big one and um he had this uh huge falcons uh tattoo on it you know and to me that just tells the story of fans and, and, and you know what, what else is happening i know i keep feel like i'm repeating myself about that i'm just so passionate about the the stuff around sports besides the the game action well, it's yeah. obviously caught the attention because, I mean, it got you to the Atlanta Braves and and you've had, um, did we see a Sports Illustrated cover? Um, so you, you've, you've gotten the attention with what you're doing. So it's obviously working for you. And I do love that kind of second shooter concept. You were telling us a little while ago about the, the different 
lenses you use, but I, what I thought was interesting was um, your different perspective with each group. So tell us a little bit about what you're going for perspective wise. What do you mean perspective in terms of? Well, you were saying that you had a wide, so what are you shooting with your wide? And then you were, you're 70 to 200. What are you Mm -hmm. shooting with that? You know, yeah. So how you're setting that up. Sure. Sure. And these are for, uh, you know, it's different for each. It's not that much different for different sports. Right. But like for baseball, you know, I have a 400, uh, 400 millimeter and I have a 70 to 200 and I'll have a wide. And that wide is typically a 24 to 70. Now I am getting to where I'm switching up and putting primes on and and changing it out or putting a a 2X converter on the 400 just to do something funky. Like I shot an entire game at 800 millimeters uh, from the stands, just just to do something different. So uh, it wasn't quite as sharp as, you know, shooting without a converter, but just, you know, just to give me something different and a different uh, perspective on that. But, you know, the 400 obviously is for the action on the field, the pitcher, you know, you know, running bases, home plate plays, people in, you know, outfield players. 70 to 200 is going to be more for, depending on my position, but like home plate kind of plays, uh, something, uh, you know, player running at me to catch a ball. The wide really doesn't get used that much unless I go in the stands and get like kind of scenic things, right? But it, it a lot of times if there's my safety, let's say I'm in the first base photo well, the, the, the photography position just to the outside of the dugout. Uh, I don't have any of these pictures yet, but I want it where a player is running at you to catch a foul ball and is like coming over the railing, you know, like it's that shot because – if you don't have a wide, you're not going to get a picture. And I don't want to be the guy on television who had a play happen in front of him just like that. And not, not even that, I just want the picture anyway, but uh, you know, I don't want to be stuck without a camera, you know? So I'm imagining that you have um, on all of these camera lenses, they're, they're all attached to a different camera. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You you don't have time to switch anything. So are you, are, are, when you were talking about remotes earlier, the cameras are all on you, correct? You're not. No, when I have remotes, like sometimes I'll have, there's one picture I sent in to you guys that's a overhead shot of home plate. That's on the roof of uh, SunTrust Park, well, Truist Park now, uh, with the 400 millimeter shooting straight down on home plate. Uh, and that's almost full frame right there. That's cropped in a little bit to straighten it out. But uh yeah, that, that's a remote fired with a pocket wizard. That one, you know, is a little bit risky because if, uh, if it rains, you got to have a rain cover on it. You can't get to it. You know, once you put it up, you cannot get to that till after the game. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. No, no, that's, that was, I was, I was wondering about that when you were talking about that earlier, I was, my brain was like, okay, what is he using the pocket wizards for? Where? Yeah. Where yeah. So remote, that? So I have, so, uh, the remote, pointed at home plate. Now that's not every game. That's a lot of work to put that camera in. And I don't have time to do that every game. I would love to have a permanent situation to where I had, you know, like a camera put up there and I could remotely just turn it on and have it plugged in and the images show up on a laptop. But then it gets to be a little bit too much, like just too easy, I guess. I don't know. But I have other remotes too. Like a lot of times it, in baseball, it's 90% of the time pointed at home plate. That's where the action is. Just like in basketball, remotes are pointed at the goal, right? So, you know, there's another one where I have a remote pointed, like a 70 to 200 from inside first or third pointed at home plate to catch a, you know, a play at the plate, just like this one here. Um, So, yeah, I mean, baseball, you know, two to three remotes is typically it. You know, I mean, I've experimented with some other stuff, uh, some wider stuff. I have an idea for remote from outfield shooting kind of a 70 to 200 shot of like a like a big home run situation, you know, like somebody breaks a record, have them jogging around the bases with the fans, you know? Uh, And so I have some ideas about some other remote stuff, but you know, baseball is, is just like football. It's hard to put remotes up for football. Uh, You know, when when I worked with sports illustrated, I was an assistant and that's what I did was install and monitor and, you know, handle remote cameras, mainly with basketball. So we would put up, you know, when I worked with Rosado, we would put up like, eight to 10 cameras on lights and that gets very complicated very fast and we can i don't want to go down this rabbit hole unless you guys want to but like when you put more than one camera on a set of lights you have to lag them because the shutter lag times are different in each camera and lens setup so you have to basically program each camera to fire on a timer 
So they all fire at the exact millisecond. So the strobes hit the hit when the shutters are fully open. All right. That's really crazy tech talk. But <laughs> anyway, that remote cameras, I have got, you know, done, done them for years and basketball is where you have the most success or you can put not most success, but put more cameras up. So, so, so typically when we talk about the, you're, you're using a telephoto, um, mm -hmm. and then it, the 70 to 200 and then something that's a little bit, uh, wider. Mm -hmm. So those are the three cameras you, you have on you at mm -hmm. the, when you're, when you're shooting the game so that you can manipulate those different cameras. Is that, yeah, and I would love to get down to two cameras. Like that would be ideal for me. It gets to be so much moving around with three cameras, you know. Uh, and, you know, like I shot a football game for Sports Illustrated uh, this past year over in uh, Tuscaloosa with um, uh, Simon Broody, former Sports Illustrated staff photographer. And, you know, Simon's been a, you know, he was a staffer for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. I'm not sure. But, you know, he's been a sports shooter for that long for sure. So watching him operate in that environment was incredible. Uh, you know, and I used to work with Rosado as well, but seeing these guys work with two cameras, you know, and just commit, you know, to like a focal length or, you know, a certain Simon referred to that 70 to 200 as a street sweeper. You know, you can get everything with it. He was like, you know, you need to you need to commit to a focal length and stick with it, you know, and it builds character when you can, it sounds like something David Barnett would say, you know, like it <laughs> builds character for you to do that. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm getting more and more into um, uh, shooting with primes and, and sticking with a, a focal length when I can. You know, when you're a team, team photographer, though, you have to get so, you, know, you have to get everything, you know, and so you have to be ready for just about any situation. You know, because during the game, we'll have a, uh, uh, a ceremony or like they recognize, a, you know, a, um, a soldier or any number of things that happen. I've got to run out on the field and get some wide shots of that. So I've got to have those kinds of things ready. Now, do you have a staff or is it pretty much just you? Oh, it's just me. It's just me. I mean, I work with the social media staff there a lot, you know, getting images to them. But like for me, it's, it's just me. Sometimes I'll hire a, a second photographer, you know, opening day, they'll, I'll hire, you know, two or three or four photographers to help out with stuff like that. Big events, you know, um, I'll, I'll hire, you know, freelancers to help me do it. But, you know, by and large, it's just me. So here's a question for you. It's being photojournalistic, um, you've done the Falcons and now the Braves. Mm -hmm. For those three things, is there a specific moment or capture that you have that just stands out to you from each of those different things? Like what were the? It was the Braves, the Falcons, and what's the first one? Just photojournalism in general. Oh, okay. Um, what what are do you have like if you had to go to one picture or or one particular thing that happened? You know what what picture would that be or what was the type of event that took place? Cause I'm sure you've seen a lot of different things and it's probably hard to choose one, but if you had to, what would those be? Gosh, man, that is, uh, <laughs> you hit me with a, with a big one there. Um, whew, you know, some of my favorite pictures were made early on. Um, that essay I worked on, on a tent revival preacher when I lived in Griffin, uh, working for the Griffin Daily News, I did a personal project, and it's on my website called Soul Soldier. Um, I sent you guys a picture. It's the the the, the black and white photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up now. Okay. All right. So so that um, that is Samuel McIntosh, the pastor. That's his hand, and he's praying over a gentleman in a tent revival. And I worked on that essay in 2006. And um, man, it was just it was just incredible to be able to tell that story and to uh be a part of that and i still i'm still in touch with uh pastor mcintosh he lives down in south georgia as well uh just outside of savannah and uh i worked really really hard to get that picture and just being like i said just telling that story was really important so that that's definitely up there on my on my top photographs that i've taken you know for the braves you know obviously uh when we won the pennant last year just taking pictures of well the past two years but you know taking pictures i mean that's there's a picture i have of acuna uh on a walk off i mean that that was incredible to be out there on the field taking the, taking that photograph and that's one of those what we call hail mary moments right we just got the camera you know focus this is me holding my camera and pressing the focus <laughs> you know hail marrying um and and you know but i shot at f56 i believe just to make sure I got it in focus. Um, but yeah, I mean, moments like that are, are, it's hard to say any one particular moment. I don't have this picture up, but I had a picture of uh, Matt Ryan running under 
the or through the flames at the last game at the Georgia Dome that I thought was pretty cool. Um, I wish that I had been at the well. I don't say that. I was going to say a Super Bowl, but we, I'm not going to go to that Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> that's that's a sour spot for Atlanta. Yeah, for that's, sure. that, that's too soon. We can't talk about that. Um, but you know, there's been a lot of a lot of great moments. Um, but but those probably too. I mean, you know, like any of those celebrations, like with Acuna on the field. Uh, you know, some of those celebrations in the uh, in the dugout, I mean, not in the dugout, in the clubhouse with the Braves. I have one of um, of uh, Snitker in the in the in the clubhouse, you know, covered in champagne with the goggles. Ah, you know, uh, those kind of things are really special uh, to see to see how hard the players have worked and the coaches and staff and get to that moment, you know. So I know you said you you were traveling 81 games a year with the team. No, no, no. 81 at home. Okay. Only home oh, 81 at home. Okay. Yeah. So you're not, you don't travel with them. You're just doing, you're doing at home. Yeah. Just home games. I mean, if it were, I mean, it would be a hundred It's 81 home games. So it'd be 162 games total. I don't know that I could hang on. I mean, that, that would just be another planet of work. Um, that would be really hard to do, uh, you know, for one person. I mean, I'd be happy to, you know, if, if there's several of us, but like, that's, that's a lot, you know, so, so then I guess each team's photographer is covering the home games wherever the team is. So, yeah, I mean, they're like for the Braves or teams in general. So most teams, um, and I'm, I'm fairly new to MLB photography, so I can't speak for, you know, teams in general, but, um, uh, you know, most times they're not traveling a photographer. Uh, every, every club is different with their photographer. Some are staff, some are freelance, uh, some travel and do all the games. Um, like John Soho, you know, with the Dodgers, you know, he truck covers a lot of games on the road. Uh, so, you know, what'll happen is there's also the, uh, LCC's licensed content creators for MLB that shoot social media. So, mm -hmm. you know, each, uh, each team has one of those, but that person sh shoots for the other team as well. Okay. So when they travel, you know, the Braves will get images from that person. They also get pictures from the wires, you know? Uh, Getty is the official, you know, uh, a photo agency for MLB as well. So they get images from Getty and AP and USA Today and stuff like that. Uh, and then the LCCs provide images directly to the teams um, as well. So that's where they get their photo needs on the road. But, you know, at home, it would be me. So I guess my question, I, I got a little diverted there because I all sure. of a sudden got fascinated by that point too. Mm -hmm. But um, 81 games, you really get to know the players mm -hmm. well, I'm guessing. So are you... Tell us a little bit about the relationships you build. I, I mean, have you gotten to know the, the the staffs well, the players well? Yeah, I mean, you know, you get to know them. You see them at batting practices. You, you know, uh, you know, every day there's there's batting practice two or three hours before the game starts. You know, so you, you know they see you there all the time. You know, most of the time these players are in their zones, right? You know, they're so focused on. I'm sorry, my dog's barking. Um, <laughs> you know, they're so focused on what's going on. They could care less about what I'm doing, but you know, during batting practice and lighter, lighter, I say lighter times when they're not focused, you know, I'm sure, you know, you get to know them, build that rapport. They know I'm with the team, you know, they can trust me. Uh, you know, it's not, um, it's not the same as like a news photographer, right? Um, it's a different relationship. They know the pictures are just for the team. They get a little playful, you know, they, they'll, they'll, they'll pose for you and act silly and different things like that. And you learn which players do that, and which players don't. Some players are just not interested in that kind of thing. And that's fine. That's just how they operate. Right. You know, that's just not, you know, some players don't have social media, don't have a social media presence at all. So they're, they're really not going to be interested in those kinds of things. And they're nice to you. They're just not going to ham it up for the camera or, or that kinds of thing, those kinds of things. But it definitely helps, you know, building the relationships with, uh, with players, you know, just like it's the same with photojournalism, the same, just life in general, building trust, you know, they can trust you, uh, uh, and, and that, that develops over time. I don't know. Did that answer your question? It, it did, because I imagine that, you know, um, that really does play in your photojournalism roots is that you can, you can bring some more humanistic elements to these photographs so it's not all about the sports and the stats and I know Ken's going to take a question we've got in chat but I do want to I, I want to shout out to my friend Jim Jones who is uh, assistant manager with the Rome Braves and always trying to get me to, to go go shoot some stuff there and one of these days I'm going to go do that um can you want to you want to grab that one 
Yes, this one comes from Katie Nowak. Um, big fan. I'm a current graphic designer, team photographer for a minor league baseball team. Any advice on working my way up to a major league team photographer position? That's a great question. That's one that I get a lot, right? I uh, bet. <laughs> yeah. You know, every team is different. When I say that, it's like how the relate the relationship with the photographer, like I said, some are staff, some are, you know, um, um, freelance, contract, et cetera. So it just depends, you know, just like with anything like that, though, you know, you try to find out who's in charge, you know, send them your work, get to know uh, the team photographer of the team you're trying to, to work for, or, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's easier when you have like a specific team you're going after, cause you can learn, you know, what's going on with that, you know, out, there's not like going to be a general, um, you know, job board for those kinds of things. And they're hard to come across. Right. I mean, it's not, you know, team photography positions don't come open that often. Uh, so my, my suggestion would be to find a few teams that you're interested in working for and developing relationships with those people, showing your work, you know, um, and letting the photographer know you're not trying to take his or her job, but that you're interested in this kind of work. You know, maybe you could assist, maybe you could be a second shooter, you know, maybe you could, uh, you know, say, Hey, I'd love to come, you know, shoot a game or something, um, you know, and, and see if that's possible, you know, even if you shoot it for free or something like that on, on the first time basis. But I don't want to advocate shooting for free. I don't want to start an entire. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but it's like an intern thing. It's it's not. Yeah. And, and some of them have internships. Some of them have different programs. Um, and so you know, find out what those teams have. It, it's better to go after specific teams than it would be into to in general, want to be a team photographer, you know, if, you know, first off, narrow it down to a sport then find the teams you want to work for and figure out those, where, you know, how to, how to get into those organizations, how to get to know the people, you know, just like you would, if you wanted to work at Zeiss, you know, you find out who's hiring, who does that, that kind of stuff. Right. We, we, we laugh because Kenneth and I get asked that question all the time. How do you get to be a Zeiss ambassador? And we're like, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> they ask you. <laughs> so it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all the work, you know, and, and that's yeah. really what it comes down to. A lot of people ask me, cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the decision team here in the U S but really it comes down to how you fill the frame, how, you know, how you, how you portray your passion. And I kind of, I, I had a question for you, Kevin, cause I was sure. looking through some of the images that you sent. Uh, and there's one, uh, from the New York times here, uh, uh about food it's a, a young girl in front of an ice cream truck or mm. or something like that um and i i it, it strikes me because i i think i read that article um but I also within that frame you're telling a, a an amazing story um and i guess my question is are, are you are you on the hunt for that kind of situation or do they just happen organically and it catches your eye and and you know the story you want to tell well thank you i appreciate those kind words uh, yeah, for this one, it just kind of all fell into place. Like we we're doing a story on Anthony's rolling truck, right? And that is literally a truck that rolls around is rolling store. I mean, is what it's called. Anthony's rolling store. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he rides around and, oh, there it is right there. Yeah. <laughs> and he sells like, you know, ice cream and potato chips and Cokes and people can call him and he will deliver like, you know, a Coke and a pack, you know, a bag of potato chips it, it was amazing i just rode around with this guy all day and so this was at like the boys and girls club uh in atlanta and i'm standing up against a wall and the light on that you can see the brick in the uh window and so the sun is hitting that wall and bouncing and kind of lighting this thing up and he just parked there for like i don't know 15 20 minutes as these kids came out one by one and uh and, and got that and so i was just framing this up and this girl I mean, this just happened. I was just like, you know, as it's happened, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, I can't believe that I got it so clean that it's just her. I have a few others where there's like, you know, heads in the front and the kind of the foreground, which are kind of cool. But this one I thought was just so much better. Um, and you got the little lens flare. It just kind of all worked out. But to answer your question, I mean, it, it, with photojournalism, like so much of photography, you know, it's this is almost like, you know, same thing as wildlife photography. You're just in place and you, you just watch you know, and you're just ready to shoot and you got to make sure that, you know, making sure that I was dialed in, you know, what I mean by that is that my exposures are set. I'm focused where I need to be. I'm paying attention and I'm ready to shoot. You know, I'm not, 
you know, zoned off thinking about something else or checking my phone or whatever, because it's so easy to get distracted than like being dialed into what's going on. And, right. and you know, just like, just like anything, you know, you just got to be ready for it to, I'll say anything, you know, in, especially in photography, you know, you just got to have all the things there and then it happens, you know, like having the right, I mean, I, I don't want to get caught up in gear, but having the right gear and being in the right spot and, you know, and, and waiting and being there and doing all the work, you get there and then the pictures will happen, you know? Well, you trust, you trust, you have the right gear, you trust your gear, you yeah. trust your sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, I mean, there's a ton of pictures I've screwed up and missed. And, you know, there's always those ones you think about like, ah, if I'd have done that, you know, there's a million of those, you know? Yeah. But that, that's the thing about photography is all we see are what we got right. You know, like we exactly. don't see the, the thousands and tens of thousands of frames that were just utter garbage. And, and that's, I think is the biggest uh, hurdle in any creative endeavor is just getting over that, you know, cause it's like, you have to create so much crap to get to the good stuff, you know? And it's so, it can be so uh, discouraging, you know? And so I uh, just encourage anyone to just keep, keep plugging along, keep trying and keep shooting. Um, you know, I've got terabytes of crap. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, I did, I have thrown away, deleted a decent amount of photography since I've been in quarantine, which has actually been, it felt like the Marie Kondo, you know, like does, does the, do these photos bring me joy? And no. like so, so many of them did not. <laughs> and so I would delete entire folders like, nope, I don't need that anymore. You know, it felt good. It's, it's, we, we keep coming back to that point of walking without a net. And that's kind of what that is. It's kind of like, all right, we can let this go. We can, we can move on yeah. to something else. We've got a great question here from a hack young K Chang Chang. How do you decide where you would photograph the moments, major moments when there's a lot of action going on at one place? So I'm guessing um, they're talking about uh, sports, right? And so- Yeah, back to baseball. Yeah, back to baseball. <laughs> you know, football is, so baseball is a little bit easier because you have, pretty much you have certain spots you can be, right? Unless you go up into the stands and then it's kind of a free for all. You can be, you know, wherever you want to be unless you're in somebody's way. But you know, you basically have like four or five spots to shoot from inside or outside the dugouts. And that's really it really. I mean, there's not a whole lot of opportunity or places to shoot from in baseball. Football is, is so, has so much more, you're a lot, well, you have the entire, I call them like the use, like if these are the 20 yard lines, you can go from 20 to 20 all the way around the end zones. Right. So you can meet any of the, you know, anywhere around there, as long as you're not in somebody's way or somebody's in your way. But uh, to answer the question, you know, it, it takes, for me, it's taken years of like building that intuition of when something good's about to happen and where it's going to happen. That's always really hard. When I worked with Sports Illustrated, especially with uh, Bob Rosado, we covered a lot of basketball and football. Basketball, you're kind of stuck in one spot. Football, you know, that's where, you know, you can really be in the right spot at the right time. You know, you can be at the other end of the field when they run a, you know, run a touchdown from a kickoff, right? And if you're in the right spot, you look like a genius. If you're not, you know, they're running away from you, you know? And so when you're working for Sports Illustrated, that kind of stuff is critical. You know, who wins the game, who has the big moment, you know, all those kinds of things. And I remember working with him and uh, we would be, uh, you know, when I would assist him in football, I'd be standing behind him. He would shoot with like a 400 millimeter and a 600, and a 70 to two and a 50. And so he would be like on the four, I'd be holding the six and he would like dump the four and then grab the 70 to two. So I would always have to be paying attention to what he's doing. And we would be like in a position on the field and he would just get up he wouldn't tell me anything. He would just get up and move, you know, five yards down the field. I have to scoop all the equipment and follow him. And so he would do that. And then the play would happen like right in our laps. And I'd be like, God, how, how did you know? And he would just say, Oh, well, I knew the matchup. He had only thrown to that guy twice today. And now he got a better matchup on the tight end. And they've been running a slant route, you know, during third quarter, like all these things. I was like, what? Like it, it's, it's wild. What, what goes into th those kinds of decisions. And so, you know, it's, you know, and I'm, I'm not that smart about, you know, baseball or football, knowing exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's over built over years of, of, of seeing things unfold and paying attention and learning more about the game, becoming a student of the game of what's going to happen in certain situations, you can better prepare yourself for that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's the fun part about it though. It's like fishing, you know, like what part of the lake do you go in and which lure do you use? You know, which, which part of the field do you go on and which lens do you use? Right. So 
you know, and you're going to get burned, you know, you're going to be in the wrong spot. Guaranteed. It's happened to me a million times. Um, I made a cool picture one time. I thought like it, uh, it was a, the iron bowl, Alabama, Auburn, and the, the guy ran a touchdown away from me with a 400. So I just, obviously it's wide. So then I have the fans cheering in the stands and the guy running and the guy falling. And so it's a little bit more of an atmospheric photo. It's not that tight running at you shot, but I tried to make, try to make something out of it, you know? So there's that old joke about the difference in a doctor and a photographer is that a photographer sells his mistakes. So, you know, you can make a mistake and no one has to know about it. Right. So try to try to tur put a creative spin on it. Yeah. Do make something out of it. Right. Lemonade. One of the things that I love about when we talk to Greg Waterman and Greg is one of our ambassadors and he's a rock and roll photographer. So he gets these stage shots that only he can get because mm -hmm. he is the band's photographer. Mm -hmm. So a little bit on for the for the Braves, where do you get to shoot from that nobody else gets to shoot from? What perspectives are just yours that you own? Yeah, so a lot of those are going to be like in the clubhouse, which I'm not at the, in there a lot, but particularly like when there's a big celebration, I'm, I'm the first guy in there. You know, I went on the road with them last year uh, when they played um, St. Louis uh, in the division series. So, you know, I got, I didn't, I was on the plane with them, but, you know, I went with them a lot, but, you know, I was in the clubhouse there, you know, them coming and going from the hotel, stuff like that. Um, you know, and then just like being at, you know, at batting practice and different, different things like that to where I'm closer to the players. They trust me. They know me things like that, uh, that, that I get to see. And I'm fairly new, you know, I've, been, I've only been, you know, working for the Braves uh, in this capacity since 2018. So, and I've got a lot of, a lot of, growing to do in this department in terms of like getting more access and things like that, you know, it's stuff that grows over time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, clubhouse stuff when there's especially a big celebration and things of that sort, you know, in those kinds of situations, you know, like team photographers are in first and then everybody else comes, all the other media comes in later. Uh, so those first couple of moments in there are pretty special, like in the clubhouse. Yeah. Cause you're really, you know, like kind of like how Greg is, he's, you know, when he's photographing Pitbull, he's been there for some very monumental moments that only he has that only he was there to actually witness that, you yeah. know, as the artist was creating things. And so you're kind of like that for the players, you actually see emotions that they might have, you know, if it's a, a game winning loss, even, you know, you're, you're there to capture those, those really key moments. Mm -hmm. you probably have things that I'm sure that some of the players have probably may have seen your work and like, wow, I, I can't believe you, you captured that. It might be something <laughs> special for some people and it just might yeah. be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he actually took that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say that picture of um, Acuna earlier of him celebrating on the field. So I was the only one, there's me in television out there. Mm -hmm. So those types of moments, it's those are what the, the, the kind of access that team photographers have, right? Because you know, the, the wire, I'd say the wire shooters, you know, like AP and Getty and all, all those photographers and, you know, Atlanta Journal Constitution, other newspapers, they come out on the field after that. But as soon as that walk off happens, as soon as the, the play is dead, but like the, the celebrations happening, I run out like sprint onto the field. Like I've got my wide angle ready with the exposure I want. I've got all my other cameras down. I'm paying attention to this moment. I'm running out there as fast as I can with this camera. And I'm, you know, these are the kinds of, I know I'm answering the same question over, but like these moments like that, I'm pointing at my computer screen, uh, <laughs> are, are, we kind of got that <laughs> or what, uh, what team photographers get. And this is an interesting thing. I shot, you know, I switched to Sony last year and Sony and I'm shooting on silent mode. So it's funny when you do these Hail Marys, you don't know if the camera's firing. Yes. Like, <laughs> it's wild. Like I kind of wish it would like vibrate like a, uh, like a PlayStation controller or something. So at least you knew that it was firing. But all you can do is look at it and see if the red lights on. And that just means that it's recording data. But like, you know, anyway, it's kind of funny because you're just like, I hope it's shooting. Uh, but you know, you're running around and, and getting those kinds of moments where, uh, you know, by the time that a lot of the other photographers make it out there, the moments died down a little bit, you know, the celebration, um, you know, kind of dies down after a few, few minutes. Let me ask you this. On top of that, as far as those types of moments happening at just the spur of the moment, how how much do you actually have to be a lover of the game? Is that very important for what you're doing, of being a, a avid lover of baseball or football? Because you really have to pay attention to what's going because just mm -hmm. that split second, it seems, you could miss a, a photo like that. So how important is that? 
You know, it, it's definitely important. And, you know, I just don't want to be the photographer who missed it. Right. So it's that fear, you know, of missing something really important that I wasn't paying attention for. And you kind of get a, an intuition of when to pay attention and when you can not, when you can kind of look off, you know, it depends on the, the, the momentum of the game, right. The, learning those kinds of things, uh, especially in, <clears throat> well, not to say especially, but I remember particularly in football learning that to when a team would, would get momentum and when you could not, because the, the, the tendency in football is to photograph offense all the time, right. To photo, follow the ball and, you know, the, the quarterback and the guy running the ball and catching the ball and things like that. But when you have a team who's do, starting to dominate the other team, then you need to shoot a little bit more defense, right? Sacking the quarterback, running through the line, things like that. And so learning how to follow that momentum becomes uh, key, you know, but you develop an intuition over that. Um, when, when to pay attention, like I need to really be keyed in on this. And football is a little easier because like the action is like very specific. It starts when he hikes the ball and it stops and the whistle's blown. So, you know, it's yeah. a very finite time uh, for the actual action. In baseball, you can get caught sleeping very easily. You know, if they turn around and, you know, the pitcher turns around and throws to first to try to catch a guy out at first and he misses it and the guy on third runs home. I mean, th that can happen in, you know, like two seconds. And I've missed plays like that to where something happens and the guy on third is 10 feet off third and is already home and slid in third and you whip around and all you have is a, is a cloud of dust. And you're just like, oh my God. So, you know, it's learning how to pay attention to those things to when you can you know, look elsewhere in the fans or, or, or things like that. So I have to admit, I'm, I'm not a sports photographer. I'm not a sports fan for the most bit. So I have my friends chiming in because I needed some ringers to ask some questions. So uh, my friend, Michael Dill is a uh, sport. He's a baseball photographer. So he wanted to know, are you using auto ASO on game nights? ISO, auto ISO. Auto ISO. The only time I use auto ISO is on a remote camera when I have a, well, pretty much any time really. Uh, but to answer your question, no, my handhelds, um, I use uh, manual everything, manual, you know, ISO, shutter aperture, all of it. Uh, it's really handy on remotes when, uh, you know, you have a cloud come over or, or a night game that starts from day to night. And I know he's asking that question, or I'm sure he is because like, it's easy for a cloud to come over and the, the exposure change instantly or in a situation to where half the field is in sun and half the field's in shade. And then you've got somebody or football, any of it, you know, they're running through that. And the exposure from bright sun to shade is about like seven stops. I mean, it's just insane. Right. So auto ISO, excuse me. Um, I don't like it on handheld cameras. It's, per, it's great for me on remotes and stuff like that. Uh, but, but for that, I don't like it. I, I tend to split the difference. And so like, I'll just, if let's say if it's sun to shadow, I'll just like open up. Um, that's me turning my shutter with my thumb. Uh, I'll just open up a few stops and split. I, I can't make it. I don't want to get to the exact exposure of the shade because if it goes back to sun. Then I'm really overexposed. So I just usually try to try to split the difference and I'll shoot at a high enough shutter speed like most of the times I'll shoot at one twenty five hundredth of a second. Uh, and that way, if I need to come off of that, like open up, you know, back to 1250th or even a thousand, I can, and it'll be okay. If I'm already at 15 hundredth of a second and I come down to, you know, 800 or 500, then I'm going to, I might get screwed with some action, you know, some blur. So that gives me a little leeway that I can open up. So my friend Doug Berger, um, who thinks he's a CBS reporter here, because he's asked a question and a follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doug is a motorsports photographer, and I absolutely love Doug. He says, Kevin, tossing you a softball here. This is this is the first question. On average, how many photos frames do you take in a total baseball game, and how many uh, shot with a football? You were referring to. Uh, I don't know. What, I guess he's talking about the Alabama Iron Bowl game, but I'll typically shoot at a baseball game. Um, and I'm shooting with these Sony's and they're 20 frames a second. And I've gotten my baseball down to about 2,500. So that's about, that's a good, that's a good number for me, you know, and I'll edit out, you know, I don't know, typically 75 to hundred a game. And I might go back and get some more for stock, you know, some kind of just clean pictures and different, you know, clean, um, you know, isolated pictures of players um, at a football game. I'll tend to shoot more, you know, typically three to 4,000 uh, for a game you know, is not uncommon. 5,000 is a lot. 
You know, I think I shot 7,000 at the Super Bowl uh, when it was in Atlanta two years ago. But I was, that was my first game full Sony. Like I had borrowed some Sonys and was like really trying to get into it. And um, 20 frames a second is mind blowing, especially when it's, you know, you're not seeing the shutter. So you just have a little thing blinking and you're like, oh my God, I just took 400 pictures. <laughs> Why did I do that? And there, that was that whole trust thing again. You weren't, you weren't there yet with the trust. So yeah. You know, you're just like, ah, you know, hope it's working, you know? So, so yeah. the follow-up part of that from Doug was, and I, I think you started to broach this a little bit. Are you using any, any assistance to process, um, to turn these around? No, no. I mean, I, I'll have, I, I don't use assistance at baseball games. I have, uh, like I said, I'll bring in some stringers to help shoot. Uh, now, at, you know, at a big championship game or, you know, division series game, something like that. I'll ha you know, may have somebody come in and run a computer and get some images out faster, things like that. But, but I'm, you know, 95% of the time, a one man show. And I do see a question here. It says, does 2,500 include remotes and that, no, that's my handheld You know, a remote camera can easily have another thousand depends on the action. I mean, if nothing happens, I mean, that's the thing about baseball, right? You know, the action is going to be for remote cameras is at the plate. If there are no plays at the plate, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of pictures. I will shoot though like players batting just to get different, a different angle of, of that kind of stuff. But it typically doesn't yield a lot of good photos. It's only when there are plays at the plate. And he, asked, he asked if you were shooting raw. I'm sorry, Ken, I don't mean to, to step okay. on you. <laughs> I am shooting raw and I'm, I'm um, and we were talking about that earlier, Tracy, like I, I just love raw files and I can get away with it right now. Um, I do think I'm going to end up switching to JPEG for games. Um, I've just been raw since I could. Um, and like I said, I just love the, the, the latitude it gives me. Um, I feel like I get a better, a better processed image in the end. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm shooting raw right now, but, and I'll stick with raw for especially portraits you know, photojournalism work, I'll stick with raw. Um, and, uh, and however, there's a debate, you know, like, Ro I think if you shoot for Reuters, you have to shoot JPEG, uh, that, that because of fa manipulation and whatnot, they, they have switched to JPEG to, uh, try to avoid any of that stuff. Um, I don't, and you can still manipulate a raw file. I mean, a JPEG file, but anyway, um, I, um, uh, so yeah, I'll probably switch to uh, JPEG for games. I think that's going to be my, my next move on that. Just to, we talked about it though. I mean, like an A9, a, it would save about half the space, which adds up over a, in a season. So like a, I shoot with the Sony A9s and those are a 24 meg raw file and a 10 meg JPEG file. Um, so I'd save, you know, a little bit more than, a little more than half. It's, it's not just the, the space it saves it also, because you're making your decisions in camera. It's, it saves you time post-processing time because you're you don't have to make those decisions on the back end because you've already made them you just ship the ship the images out so it's yeah it doesn't say many times there too. i'm not doing a ton of post process post processing and then plus um it's going to be a lot of batch processing so you know i'm going to tweak photos here and there but i don't spend a lot of time in post like people are surprised at that like i really don't like it's post is um I, I just don't do a lot. I barely do. I, you know, I do some dodging and burning, but hardly any. Uh, and you know, so it's the, po it's not going to save me so much in post. It's just going to be hard drive space. That's what. I'm then it's making. time to let go. Just time to let go. Right. <laughs> 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 Kenneth, did you have a question? Um, what was that question? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled right over him a long time ago. So he forgot. <laughs> I yeah. really did. I, I, Maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will. I see my longtime assistant Janetta Poshis in there, so I just want to wave to wave to Janetta. Mm. Uh, yeah, are there any other pictures you guys want to talk about or questions? Or um, yeah, we're kind of running up on time. And we have been going out this. It was a very easy one hour conversation. This you, has been an hour blown away. How did what, <laughs> what happened? Yeah, no, it, it, we we often go right up to an hour um, and sometimes over because the, we like I said, we just keep going and, and it's it's all friends here. And, you know, we'd love to talk about yeah. the art and the craft and how you bring your passion to the to the frame. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's a question because uh, I finally thought about it, Tracy. What <laughs> <else>? <laughs> Sorry, Kenneth. <laughs> 
so have you had any games? I, I haven't kept up with the, the brave seasons of uh, the last few years, mm-hmm. but have you had any games where it just, have, you know, where it's like 16 innings and there's no one that has scored, maybe it'd be one to one or something. Have you had any games like that yet? And if you've had any long games to where it may have been like, no one's hitting anything. It's mm-hmm. almost like nothing's really going on. You know, how have those experiences been? You know, there was a really long uh, rain delay last year, like two or three hours. And, you know, I just like flip on like that's the to me, that's the great thing about doing documentary photography. There's always something to document. Right. Even if you're shooting for a team or whatever, it's not technically photojournalism, but there's always a story to be told. And so even if it's people just hanging out up in the concourse waiting for the game to start, I just go and make pictures there. I just go hang out and do other things. Uh, I haven't had any like really crazy long games. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I, I just try to find, like I'll shoot foul balls going into the stands. Like anything, I'll try to make a game out of it to where I like, because trying to catch a foul ball as a fan tries to catch it, you know, as 15 hands go up and try to catch foul balls. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do that, right? Or whatever it is, or try to find something interesting somewhere else. You know, like when I used to go, uh, when I was a, a newspaper photographer, I'd have to go cover like, uh, I say when I was in, like a staff newspaper photographer at these smaller papers, like at the Griffin Daily News, I'd have to go cover, you know, city commission or city council. Uh, uh, um, um, what am I trying to say? Not events, but like their, their sessions, right? And a meeting, that's what I'm trying to say, city council meeting. And uh you know, those can be incredibly boring. Like, you know, it's just people up there talking for an hour and a half or whatever. You never know how long, how long it's going to last, but it's important pictures. So I would try to make some kind of interesting frame with someone's hair or like somebody, a little kid playing in the corner or like, who knows, just try to make something, an interesting frame out of it. And that goes back to trying to make pictures for me, uh, always, you know, trying to make something interesting, creative that kind of fulfills that creative, uh, desire in me and not just about, you know, the client and, you know, taking care of your client is very important. It's like, you know, number one, making sure that's taken care of, but also taking pictures for your creative side that, you know, uh, uh, that, that, you know, keep yourself entertained and keep yourself curious and keep shooting. Okay, great. <clears throat> we got another question from Mr. Steve Roberts, who okay. has during game time, are you sending images via FTP? Or are you shooting via Ethernet direct to a server um, so marketing can grab images for social media? That's a great question, Steve. Uh, you know, before I was shooting Sony, I was taking my laptop and creating it, treating it just like I was, like if I were shooting on deadline for, you know, Getty Images, where I would in, take a card, grab five or 10 images, edit, and then email or FTP or text out or whatever. Um, now what I do with these Sony cameras is I Bluetooth full res JPEGs to my phone, edit in Lightroom mobile, which you can also do batch processing, just like copy settings, paste. And then I text it out. Like I'm on a text chain I'm on an iPhone. So there's like, I don't know, 15 people on a text. And I just literally text out like 10 photos. I mean, it's incredibly fast. Like I can get a picture out between pitches sometimes. Wow. wow! And you know, are you using the the original A9 or the new A9 II uh, with the kind of the added benefits that they've kind of done with people who are in photojournalism and, and photographing sports in terms of getting images out and uh, where people can now, I think you can like make annotations or something like that in, in the A9 Mark II. Well, you um, can, they have voice recording, which is huge. Yes, the voice recording. Yeah, that's, that's massive. No, I have A9 ones. I don't have the new ones. I would love to have the, the A92s, like the, the voice recording, and it does 10 frames a second mechanical shutter. Where yes. Does five frames a second. Uh, interesting thing, though, they switched slots one and two around backwards on the A92. Yes. <laughs> Why? I makes, I have, because it's, it's very specific to my workflow because I have raw files going to one folder to uh, slot one and JPEGs going to slot two. That's because, or backwards, I'm sorry, I have that backwards. I have uh, JPEGs going to slot one so that when I transfer files from my camera to my phone, it transfers a full res JPEG. Because if you transfer a JPEG from a RAW and a Sony, it's a small file. Right. So I send, anyway, 
I, when, when I found that out, I was like, wow, I can't upgrade just one camera. I have to upgrade all three because I can't have a camera that's got the slots reversed. It's different, right. That up the very first time. Right. And it makes sense. So I, I know we've got to wrap this up because we have now been talking for an hour, but I just have one last, I, it just went so fast. Sure. One last follow up question for you, just bringing it back to storytelling because I, I really love the soul of who you are there. So do you find during the course of the season that you become vested in certain players and that you just really want to tell their stories? What happens is, certain players have like stories that unfold over the season, right? Like Acuna coming up on, you know, 40 home runs and 40 stolen bases. Right. Or, you know, someone who's having like, you know, like Brian McCann last, it was his last season. You don't know that till they retire, but you know, there's certain things that are just kind of special that you notice and you become invested in those stories. Right. So it is, uh, but even within not even certain player is not, maybe it's not specific to one player, but like, the Braves, for example, have such a great chemistry. It's a lot of young players, a lot of Latin players, a lot of guys that just like, you know, gel so well together. And, you know, telling those kinds of stories are something that, that I pay attention to and just unfold throughout the season. Or like a relationship between um, players and coaches like Ron Washington um, and Ozzy, you know, like seeing those kinds of special relationships develop, you know, kind of following those and keeping your eye out for those kinds of things definitely something that that i think is important awesome very great um tony you want to take us out here yeah so don't take us out don't take us out (laughs) what a great conversation though absolutely and we we do thank you kevin for joining us today it's fantastic conversation a lot of good in-depth questions um from our from our uh, live chat as well. So it was good to hear the stories you are. And, and I, I, it always excites me to hear about why somebody fills the frame the way they do. Um, good luck on catching that, uh, that foul ball photo. We'll be looking for that one in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so my thanks today to uh, photographer Kevin Lyles for joining uh, our team today. Uh, as always, thank you, Kenneth. And thank you, Tracy, our Zeiss ambassadors who, are, who lead the conversation here. Uh, I'm Tony. I'll be with you again on Friday. You can join us. We're going to be talking again with Gene Sooks from uh, Sony. Uh, I'll get all those questions about uh, why they did switch the card slots. Uh, we'll make sure that <laughs> be prepared, Gene. <laughs> Be prepared. So, so Gene, yeah, we're coming for you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for a spirited conversation today. And we look forward to seeing you again on Zeiss Conversations in the future. Bye-bye now. See you guys.